Welcome to another episode of Keep It Fictional, the book podcast from the Port Moody Public Library. My name is Sadie, and I am joined today by my book friends, Virginia and Allison and Kareen. Hello, everyone. I am very excited to talk about books today. And our topic for today has is something that has been discussed throughout time for quite a while. William Shakespeare asked, What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. According to Romeo and according to William Shakespeare, a name does not matter. A name does not really add anything. And in this situation, of course, Romeo was trying to distance himself and Juliet from their name so that they could be in love and happy, which, as we all know, did not work out for them. Uh, But maybe he's right. Maybe a name does not really matter all that much. However, if you look through other sources, that is not the case. A lot of people think that a name is one of the most important things. Many fantasy writers write about how knowing a person's name means that you can control them. Knowing their true name means that you have power over them. Uh, The BBC said that uh, knowing someone's name gives you a lot of information about them. It tells you something about the kind of person they are. I don't know if I agree with that, as many of us uh, had our names given to us when we were a baby and had no control over our names. Uh, So I'm not sure how much that actually says. But as you have probably figured out, the topic we are going to be talking about today is books with people's names in them, and more specifically, books with people's names in the title. And we are going to see if the book maybe revolves around this person, or maybe it's just a mention of the person, and then it moves on to something else. We'll never know, or, or we will know, but we'll we'll have to find out. <laughs> All right, we are going to start our book talks today with Virginia. Virginia, what name book did you bring for us today? Uh, first of all, Sadie, thank you so much for picking this topic because you helped me uh, knock some books off my TBR <laughs> just because you helped me limit what it is that I should be reading. So thank you for that. Um, and the books that I want to share um, is The Human Origins of Beatrice Potter and Other Essential Ghosts. And it is a debut novel that came out this year by Soraya Palmer. And the magic in this book as in many literary fiction, is not so much in the storyline or the plot itself, but is in the telling and in the execution. And I was drawn to the book because in the book jacket, it said that folktales and spirits animated this lively and unforgettable coming of each tale. And I thought that was awesome. I always love books that incorporate folktales into the story. And author Soraya Palmer definitely shares stories that she grew up with in her Jamaican Trinidadian family. And it's, but it's so much more than just, you know, animating the book because the stories, maybe more accurately, the act of telling and retelling these stories gives life to the characters and they became life-sustaining and it shows us really how important stories are and it really celebrate that and I would say that is the star of this book among many, many other stars in here. So the book is told mostly from the points of view of two sisters, older sister Sasha and younger sister Sora. It's a story of how their family is falling apart Their mother Beatrice is pregnant and their father Nigel is away very often on business, leaving their mother to take care of everything. And in their house, away on business comes in heavy quotation marks because even young Sora knows what this means is that their father is spending time with another woman, a white woman that lives in Germany, they think. Eventually, the father will move this woman to the States, to Brooklyn. He will set her up in an apartment not far from the house, and he will move in with her. The mother will give birth to the younger sister, Kayla. Her headaches will get worse and worse. She will be diagnosed with an illness. And realizing that no doctors can help her here, 
the mother will want to move back to Trinidad to live with her mother, who is a healer, but not someone that the sisters think can save their mother, despite all the stories about what their grandmother can do. Sora and Kayla at some point will move in with their father and the woman. They will find out that the woman has a child around the same age as Kayla because she and their mother were pregnant around the same time. Sora would try to become a writer like their father who didn't quite make it. And she would try to spend her time in a journal, mostly just writing stories and trying to write stories. Sasha as a teen and young adult will struggle with her sexuality. She will try to hide the fact that she likes girls from her mother. She will fall hard for a girl named Shay. Thinking that Shay feels the same about her, Sasha will be shocked when she finds out that Shay is thinking about transitioning. And Sasha doesn't know what to do with this piece of information because she doesn't know what it means for them, for their relationship, if there was one to start with. We also get the story of why their mother moved to America in the first place and what secret their father, Nigel, has that may have broken him. As we watch this family struggle through all of this, as we see them drift apart physically as they live in different houses, different countries, and then figurative, figuratively also as they try to remember when is the last time they check in with each other, we see how these familiar folk tales that they have been telling in their family, how they are so much more than stories. When their father gets angry, he gets abusive, and whenever things start to escalate, Sasha and Sora will try to distract him by asking him, hey, dad, tell us the story of the rolling calf again, the rolling calf who haunts the butcher. Tell us how, you know, it was killed with nothing but a pen knife. When their mother tries to show their daughter what it's like and how to live in this world as a Black woman, she'll use stories about, the, uh, about Anansi, how in, their, in her version, Anansi is always a woman, a goddess, a shapeshifter, a trickster, and how telling and retelling these familiar stories became their way to communicate when words fail them. When they try to explain what they did, what why they did what they did, when they try to get their point across, when they try to make the other person understand, when they don't know what to say to each other, they turn to stories. It became their way to survive. It became their way to cope with all the cycles of trauma that afflict the family, it's became their way to find hope. And these stories bring some lightness to the book. Um, you know, you would definitely feel the pain of all the characters, but at the same time, you would be quite delighted by these stories, just as Sasha and Sora, they finally remember how they sit together as kids and they share their book of Anansi stories. And you can feel the warmth as you hear about stories about fathers turning into roosters, demons in the wall that only your mother can banish, the boy with the purple balloon, um, or Mama Diego that lives in the ocean. You will feel sort of this magic from them and there's definitely some magical realism in the book some supernatural stuff a little bit but you know I would say the story is pretty grounded that I think even people who may not you know necessarily care for those elements wouldn't mind them and there's definitely a playfulness to um Soraya's promise uh, writing that really again make the book really you know like delightful this despite it being kind of hard to read at times. Um, like in one part, for example, when she was telling Beatrice's story, you know, the author would incorporate a quiz that you have to like, you know, do as you like read the story. You know, it's, it's quite a fun book, despite sometimes a heavy subject. And I highly, highly recommend this book. And if there's one complaint I have is that there's a fair bit of spider in this book. <laughs> And I know it's a personal thing, but like, you know, I was trying really hard to read all the words rather than scan through all the spider bits, but there's, there's spiders in it. So anyway, um, yeah, so the book is The Human Origins of Beatrice Potter and Other Essential Ghosts, and it is by Soraya Palmer. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Virginia. I don't know if I could do the spider stuff either. I don't know if, uh, I, I know that, uh, yeah, when you mentioned a Nancy, a Nancy is is the, the spider. So not sure, but, but I might try and skim over those bits and check that one out. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. I am going to talk about my book next. And my book tells the story of Tuesday Mooney. 
Now, Tuesday Mooney is a bit of an oddity, um, especially at her office, which is the Boston General Hospital's fundraising office. She's 33 years old and described most commonly as a goth. Uh, she has pale skin, dark hair. She doesn't really fit in with the other many young, blonde, makeup-covered fundraising staff in her office. She rarely leaves her cubicle. She communicates almost entirely by email, and she doesn't really socialize with her coworkers. In fact, people often kind of just forget that she's there, or at least that's what Tuesday is striving for. Uh, not necessarily because she doesn't want to be friends with people, though that does have something to do with it, but because being alone and unnoticed makes Tuesday better at her job. According to Tuesday, it's easier to notice what's important when you're on the outside looking in. So Tuesday stays on the outside. If that means that people that she has worked with for years and years and years still don't recognize her when they see her on the street or in the office, then so be it. That's just a part of it. Tuesday Mooney is the title character in Kate Reculia's Tuesday Mooney Talks to Ghosts. Now, our story takes place in Boston takes place in the present day, and it mostly follows, as the title suggests, Tuesday Mooney. And Tuesday is a prospect researcher. So what Tuesday does, um, her boss describes it as one part private detective, one part property assessor, one part gossip, col gossip colonist, columnist, and one part witch. Because it is Tuesday's job to learn every last detail about any potential donor, so that when the time comes to ask them for money, she is able to tell the fundraisers which buttons to push to encourage the biggest donations. So Tuesday knows more about the rich and the elite members of Boston society than they probably know about themselves. So Tuesday is volunteering at a charity auction, and billionaire Nathaniel Allen Arches, or Archie, who is the eldest son and heir to Edgar Arches, who, side note, mysteriously disappeared five or six years ago, he shows up at this auction. And Tuesday is a little bit surprised, given what she knows about his life and about everything, that he's actually kind of likable, and he's actually kind of funny, and she actually doesn't mind talking to him and spending time with him. However, Tuesday doesn't really get the opportunity to spend a lot of time with him or to talk to him because just as the event is starting, an older man gets up from his seat. He's wearing a black opera cape, which kind of stands out a little bit amongst the much uh, more modernly dressed people um, at this auction. He stands up from his table. He screams. He takes a few steps and then he falls down dead. The man in question is eccentric billionaire Vincent Price, known throughout Boston. Well, his death is not being looked at as that suspicious. All of Boston will soon come to learn that it's far from normal. So Vincent Price is known for his love of the arcane. He's known for his insane wealth. He owns not only a literal castle in Nantucket, but also a pair of goggles that are said to allow the wearer to see ghosts. Now, Price has written his own obituary, which is published two days after his death in the Boston Globe. The obituary not only invites the entire city of Boston and everyone that they know to his funeral, costumes are required, but also invites the entire city to play a game, a, a treasure hunt of sorts all across the city of Boston. Now, this game, if won, would grant the winner a very large portion, not only of Price's fortune, but also of his collection of arcane and unique artifacts that he spent his whole life collecting. There's just one problem. Vincent Price, in all of his quirky uniqueness, has not actually given any clues to where this treasure hunt begins. And so the entire city, while they would like to participate, they are mystified and rather confused into how exactly they can go about doing this. Tuesday, however, 
is someone who has always loved puzzles. And as we know, she is wonderful at research. And she's always been drawn to kind of spooky things since she was a kid. So she immediately starts to dive into Vincent, Vincent Price's life, trying to find out, one, if this game is actually real. And if so, where the first clue is, where she can start finding this treasure hunt. So from here, Tuesday is drawn into this puzzle. She's drawn into this game that Price has laid out. Uh, alongside Tuesday in our story, we have Dex, who is Tuesday's best friend and who just happens to be sitting at the same table as Vincent Price at the auction. We have Tuesday's 14-year-old neighbor, Dory, who Tuesday tutors and who is secretly hoping that if they win this prize, she can get her hands on the ghost seeing goggles. So maybe, just maybe, she would be able to see her mother again, who died two years earlier. There's also Nathaniel, Archie Arches, who shows up unannounced at Tuesday's door to try to persuade her to solve the puzzle for him in exchange for $150,000. And then finally, we have Tuesday's childhood best friend, Abby. Now, Tuesday hasn't seen Abby since they were 16 years old, when one night, Abby went out and never came back. Tuesday has no idea what happened to Abby. Everyone assumes that she probably died, but no body was ever found. Nobody really knows what happened. But Tuesday still sometimes hears Abby. And shortly after Abby's disappearance, Tuesday heard Abby quite a bit with information that Tuesday never knew. Tuesday had no way of knowing this information. And yet in her head, she was being told this information. So Abby has stayed in Tuesday's head, whether it's actually Abby's spirit or whether it's just Tuesday's own mind creating these conversations, we, we don't really know. Uh, but she does know and she is starting to realize that Price's hunt may force her to re-examine some things that happened in her past. Um, some things that happened to Abby and to her that she thought were closed long, long ago. So this book is a bit of a ride. Um, it borders on the supernatural, but doesn't ever fully go into the supernatural. I wouldn't even say that it's magical realism because it doesn't... Um, doesn't really touch on on the magical realism elements in the same way, um, but it does a, a really good job of combining puzzles and riddles and mystery. Uh, you have family drama, you have childhood drama, and you have murder all wrapped into this kind of mystery adventure uh, novel. We follow along and try to solve the clues with Tuesday and her friends, which I always really like about a book when you get to try and solve the mystery along with them and try to figure out the clues. Tuesday is a very likable character, but she's also very, very imperfect. And I think that that adds elements to the story because we see how her imperfections and the choices that she makes start to impact um, not just kind of her present self, but also her friends and also her career and possibly uh, her future. Um, so Tuesday determination and at times obsession with Price's riddles uh, continues to grow and grow and grow and she doesn't really see the danger that she's in um, and the lies that she's been told by the people around her uh, so yes this is a really really fun book I haven't ever read anything by Kate uh, Raculia before um, I read this book I actually listened to this book right before uh, I had Evie. I, I remember cleaning and organizing my whole house while I would listen to the audiobook of this while I was trying to get ready um, um, for Evie. Uh, so I haven't had a chance to pick up anything else by uh, by this author, but I think that I probably will. It, it was a very quirky book. Um, Tuesday is a very different kind of quirky character that I think a lot of people can relate to and latch on to kind of being that outsider and not even necessarily, which I think a lot of books do, is where the outsider is trying to break her way or break their way into the inside world. Tuesday never does that. Tuesday is happy as the outsider. Tuesday is happy as who she is. Um, she's very confident in in her quirks and in herself, um, which I think makes her a, a fun character and an even more likable character, despite kind of her imperfections and the mistakes that she might make as the book uh, continues on. Uh, so yeah, so that is Tuesday Mooney Talks to Ghosts by Kate 
Reculia. All right. Well, I think that we are going to take a break from our books and ask our existential question. So our question is related to names today. And the question I have for my book friends is, do you enjoy reading books that have your name in them? And kind of alongside that, will that element make you pick up a book or not pick up a book when it when you otherwise wouldn't? And the reason I ask this question is because as a child, it did for me. Um, Sadie is not a super common name. And I would never see it on things. I always wanted the Sadie license plate magnets, the Sadie, like all of the keychains. I would never find them. They, they just didn't exist. And so when I found a book or anything that had my name in it, I would immediately pick it up. One of my favorite books as a kid was Sadie and the Snowman, uh, about a little girl who makes a snowman. And then in the spring, it melts and she keeps a little bit of it. And then she brings it out in next winter and makes the snowman again. It's a very cute book. Uh, but I liked it because it had my name in it. Um, it's changed a little bit. I think that the name Sadie is becoming more common. And when I was a kid, I wanted the common name. Now I don't. I like that the the unique name. And so when I see it in more and more books, um, I'm not always as excited as I used to be. But yeah, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> uh, but I'm curious, book friends, what are your thoughts on seeing your own name in books? But the book Sadie by Courtney Summers is like so great. So, so good. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of in the same boat as you, Sadie. <laughs> Green is not, oddly, not the most common name. However, I have worked at two libraries with someone who is also named Kareen. So I think it's just like in every library, there must be a Kareen, but that's the only place that we exist. Um, which is fine. I'm I'm good with that. I'm I'm good with us kind of staying in our lane. So yeah, I have never I I don't think I have ever ever encountered in any book that I've read uh, a character named Kareen, and definitely not with this particular spelling. Um, so I don't know how to feel, Sadie. I don't know how to feel. I don't know how I feel. Um, it'd be rad if they were a villain, though. I think it'd be a great villain name. Um, because I've always hated my name, and I thought that it would make like a really good villain. Maybe one of us needs to write a villain named Kareem. Yeah, um, I'm in a similar boat too, where Allison is not the most common name. I've run into it a couple times, um, but the main thing is there's a web comic that I really want to read where the main character is named Allison and I can't do it. It throws me off. It just it's too weird so i'm in the opposite boat as you sadie when it comes to books that have my name in them i find it really off-putting i just i can't do it. it it gets too close to home i guess <laughs> that's interesting yeah i actually i i know so many allison so that's it's interesting to hear you say that it it's not a common name because maybe just in my life i know so many allison <laughs> So I never met an Allison until I went into libraries and then suddenly Allison's everywhere. So apparently Allison is just a librarian name. I also think it's interesting that and I'm really bad about this when I read books is I don't really like mentally take in their names. I usually give all the characters nicknames. And so, yeah, so it's really rough when you're reading and they say, oh, what do you think of like so-and-so name? And I'm like, who are you talking about? Oh, you're talking about like handsome young man with like the bouffant haircut. Uh, oh, why didn't you say? I think same thing. Like, I don't remember a book ever that has Virginia as a character. Um, so I also don't have any experience of what that is like, whether I like it or not. I also, same thing, I also can't tell. But I can imagine, I do not want a book that is has a, like a, a, like if there is a book, I hope it's not, like maybe there is. I hope they're not famous. I hope they're not popular because I don't know how many people have to tell me that there's a Santa Claus. Like I, I'm done with that. So I don't need to be informed that there's a Santa Claus. Um, so yeah, so if there's a really popular book that has Virginia, I'm sure like I'll hear about it and I, I'm, I'm okay, I think. So yeah, I'm going to say no. Right, that makes sense. 
<laughs> well, thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts on names and on your own names. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to Kareen next. Kareen, what name book did you bring for us today? We really should have had Fiona for this name discussion because I feel like there's tons of books with a Fiona. Although now off the top of my head, I can't think, think of a single one. Oh, that's bad. That's really bad. Um, Yeah, so kind of going off of Sadie's book theme of childhood trauma, I'm about to bring you a book with all the childhood trauma. Um, And this book does have a content warning at the beginning of it, which I think was kind of like a, a wonderful decision by the author for um, suicidal ideation and um, child sexual abuse. So this is a really, really, really heavy book. Um, And the reason why I picked it up is because it's blurbed by Charles Yu, who, uh, of course, wrote Interior Chinatown, one of the greatest books of all time. Um, And also because the author lives in Vancouver, which I thought was really interesting. Um, So always nice to kind of like support a local author. Um, This is a fairly big book published by uh, Atria. And so I did not read what it was about before I sat down last night and committed to this entire novel. So that's on me. That is on me. Because, um, <laughs> um, yeah, the, the subject matter is really difficult, as well as it is a work of metafiction. And so this is a book that it's aware that it's a book and then playing with the fact that it is a book and one's mileage may vary with this. It can be pulled off to really great effect. Um, but in the re- my experience of it and the reviewer's experience is that it wasn't entirely successful. But this book is t- taking such like big swings that I really, really admire the writer for, for you know, trying to, to pull this off. Um, the book that I picked up is The Double Life of Benson Yu. And there are two Bensons. There's Benson who is real and a writer. And he got famous for writing a graphic novel called Iggy Samurai, which is about a lone little iguana who decides to solve crime with the help of his coyote sensei, sensei, who is a reincarnated reincarnated samurai master into the body of a coyote. And together in Central Park, they solve crime. Now, this series um, was very successful as a graphic novel and then eventually turned into several movies, of which Benson really didn't see great returns of them. And his publisher is kind of hounding him for his his next big thing. What are you going to work on next? And so when this story starts, he is kind of struggling with that, what to do next. And he gets a letter from someone from his childhood, a scene. And this letter is really disturbing to Benson because it says, I read the comics and I know that the coyote sensei is me. Some of the words there come straight out of my mouth and you owe me. You owe me money. You owe me something. I'm down on my luck. You know how I helped you when you were a child. You owe me. And so this sets older Benson off to start a new work that is loosely autobiographical about Benson, Benson Yu, who is 12 years old and living in uh, Chinatown in the 1980s. His mother has passed away. His father is a bit flashy and very absent. And so he kind of grows up with his grandma. He's bullied at school. He's smart. He's sensitive. He's artistic. Um, his really only parental figure is his aunt, Steph, and she is about to go on tour with her band. Now, of course, this is the 80s. No one has a cell phone. So all she gives him is a list of kind of where she'll be playing and some phone numbers, hopefully. And she kind of takes him out to a cafe and explains that she's going to be away for a while. And this makes Benson a little bit concerned because his grandmother his grandmother's health has been rapidly declining. He knows it. Steph knows it. But he doesn't really want to stand in the way of her dream. And so he says, everything is going to be fine. Go on your adventure. I'll be okay. And things are okay for a little while. And then his grandma gets very ill. 
and is eventually taken to the hospital and dies. And so Benson is left essentially to fend for himself. He's 12 years old. He's very resourceful. And so he manages to get by um, in some very harrowing scenes until the social worker starts knocking on the door. At which point, with no other choice, he is either saved or kidnapped by another man in the building. This man is the samurai and or Constantine. He has been recently essentially tossed out of the psychiatric hospital that he has been living in for most of his life. He's in his 20s. Um, I believe he has a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And he mostly relies on his pregnant sister and her husband for everything. Um, he, His father was um, physically abusive. His mother was very overbearing and inappropriate. Um, but he has sublimated all of this into his internal secret is that he is a reincarnated medieval samurai. And with his books that he takes out from the library, he studies all the moves and all masters all of the forms. And so he hears a voice from his kind of leader, his dynamo, that he needs to take care of the boy. But of course, this is just the fiction. Or is it? Because we are also looking at the author in the present tense, who then gets a knock on his door from a social worker who drops off 12-year-old Benson from the 1980s. Yeah. So he has to take care of his alter ego or his alternate history while he himself is struggling with the reality of this figure of the samurai or Constantine Orsi who is trying to come back into his life. So as you can tell, this is not straightforward as storytelling. It's very twisty-bendy. Um, and there's time travel involved with Greyhound buses. So, you know, very interesting in that. It's a lot about stories within stories and using fiction to kind of deal with your trauma. Um, it has a lot of interesting commentary. And I, I really do like Kevin Chong as a writer. I thought there was some really wonderful sentences in there. Um, and he has a very like sly wit writing about like the publishing business, uh, writing about fame. Um, he's got some really great comments about, you know, what what stories get to be told, what stories about like Asian immigrants get to be told, um, how much it sucked to grow up in the 80s, I think is one of the big themes. And he's not wrong. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's his um, seventh book. And so, as I said, like, this is a really big swing to try and pull off telling this kind of story with this kind of format. And I read some interviews by him, which I thought were really interesting in that he actually started this book as like a traditional narrative, like from A to B and went through the whole thing. And then at a certain point in his writing, he, he just didn't feel like it was working. And so he tried this metafiction concept um which makes it i think for a lot of readers a little bit more inaccessible because you have to suspend a lot of beliefs and have to just be willing to go with this flow um and i for me as a reader i didn't think that it that it necessarily all landed i think that um I think there are parts of it that worked really, really well. I think that the metafiction did help tell certain parts of the story, but it didn't all fit together in a way that was as satisfying as it could be. Um, and it's a really difficult book to read. Really difficult. I saw one of the reviewers akin to like walking through an oil slick. Your feet get stuck in. You have a bad feeling in the pit of your stomach as you keep reading it. And it's, it is really difficult because some really quite horrible things happen. Um, but I really admire the author for taking on such a complex subject, um, for talking about something that really isn't talked about a lot and for kind of showing the repercussions of trauma as not just a child, but as an adult and how that kind of follows him through his life. Um, 
So it's, it's a really, if you're kind of interested in looking at metafiction, if you're kind of willing to grapple with those big topics, I think that this is a really interesting book to look at as, as a piece of art dealing with trauma. Um, I think that there are parts of this book that really connect and are, are, are like wonderfully written. Um, but it is, it is a difficult read and I would definitely be very aware of the subject matter before you kind of dived into it. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I would love to sit down and talk with Kevin Chong at some point and because he lives in Vancouver, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll see if he's like speaking somewhere because I, I just kind of want to, and he actually uses, this is one of the author's most hated phrases, but I really like it, like to pick his brain. I know. Um, so I, I would love to sit down and kind of talk about the process and like how this book kind of came into being in the way that it did. Um, because I think um, he's an author that I'm definitely going to be looking at, and I can't wait to read what he he writes next. Thank you, Corinne. Yeah, that, that's an interesting way to come to that style of book is to, yeah, to write the full narrative and then adjust and change and, yeah, confuse everything. Although I do say that I think that Greyhound buses would have been greatly, greatly improved if they had a time travel element, even just like being able to get me from Nelson to Vancouver, not in 12 hours, even if it meant I was going like back in time an hour or something like that, I would be okay with that. They are, were just the worst. <laughs> All right. <laughs> For our last book talk, we have Allison. Allison, what book with a name did you bring for us today? So I'm here today with a book that's a little different than the books that have been talked about today. So imagine you're at the party to end all parties. Literally, since what was supposed to be a victory for humanity has turned into a waiting game, waiting for giant robots from space to come and annihilate the Earth. That's the situation our main character August Kitko a jazz pianist finds himself in at the start of this book contemplating whether he should try and enjoy the party apologize to his new paramour pop star Arden Violet or just throw himself off a cliff before the world ends he doesn't get the chance to do any of those things though he's playing music as the world ends but August finds himself face to face with one of the vanguards the robot sent to annihilate earth but instead of killing him it picks him up and puts him inside its chest, turning him into a conduit, a human capable of synchronizing with a vanguard in order to protect the Earth rather than destroy it. This is how my book today, August Kitko and the Mechas from Space by Alex White, begins. So this is a really fun book. It was really fast paced and it's space opera, which is one of my favorite genres. Um, it explores music, all of the conduits, um, because we find out later there's more than one uh, of these people who have been taken to fight with the rebel vanguards against the ones who want to destroy the earth. Um, it is about music and all of the people who have been chosen are musicians. And this is the way that they can interface with these giant robots is through the language of music. It's smart, it's fast, it's queer normative, which I really enjoyed. And it really deals in an interesting way with depression and survivor's guilt, because this is a world that has been ravaged by these vanguards. So many different human colonies have disappeared. A lot of people have died, but people are continuing to live on and living on in a way that they didn't expect because they thought that the world was going to come to an end. So it explores music, it explores queer romance. This book had more romance in it than I was expecting. Um, it explores depression and survivor's guilt and some truly funky futuristic fashion. Um, if so, if you want a space opera that's smart, queer normative, and with a touch of rock and roll, then uh, August Kitko and the Mechas from Space by Alex White might be for you. I like that. I, I'm curious to know what the fashion trends of this world would be. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, I don't read a lot of space opera, but I do enjoy books that touch on on music and musicians in many ways. So I might I might pick that one. 
All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for the books that you have talked about today. I go back again to William Shakespeare's question, what is in a name? Did we really answer that question today? I think that we maybe, sort of, maybe not. All of the names, they had something to do with the books. They had something to do with the characters. But I don't know if they really impacted our stories all that much. Uh, but that's up to you to decide. Listeners, that is up to you. Uh, and readers, if you would like to pick up any of these books, um, I encourage you to do so. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. We will see you and hear you next time. Have a great day. Bye, everyone.